a great enlightening focus on dyspepsia and uh, i would like to thank all the senior consultants and dear friends for being here also i'd like to thank the chairperson and moderator for being here and i would like to thank uh, team bradys who gave me an opportunity to be here to discuss something about this uh, see actually when you've been focusing about dyspepsia as we all well know something which is happening to your digestion process so what is going to happen once if your digestion is not going to get comfortable what are the various factors what are the various clinical presentation you may experience you may experience the commonest presentation might be a nausea you may have bloating you may have early satiety various presentation you may have you may have heartburn those are these are all the various classical clinical presentation if you are having this kind of events as we are know most of the population even other even physicians surgeons even general practitioners everybody will be using the ppi for this dyspepsic dyspeptic events and right from late 80s onwards we have been using ppis for a long study duration so the evolving which has been derived from from omeprazole pantoprazole so many other molecules we check or i know even up to chenetoprazole we continue in market being trying in the field but how far the ppis is going to help us we are discussed in the power one city as what our professors have been enlightened about that there are so many things right from your peptic ulcer your gastroesophageal reflux and so many other events we are being using ppi for a long study during we are going to wind up this place so what is the most important indication we are going to choose and apart from that when you are going to use ppi for a duration of time so how long we are going to use that's one strong question to be addressed apart from that most of the studies what we have mentioned you will be continuing for a duration of 2 to 3 months beyond that most of the centers will be using for 6 months 1 year long standing duration when you are going to use ppi for long standing duration you may experience see when you are going to talk about a molecule in which we are going to discuss so many merits are there but when you are doing a study we need to look into all the demerits also when you are going to address it so as we all know ppi also contain lots of adverse events being reported in various papers nowadays as professor sir what we rightly pointed out regarding your coronary event as what's called as major acute coronary events for example what is the reason for this mac which is very commonly reported but we are not very sure see we, any patient who presented to us in the back end of cardiac events we might be first thinking about that uh, about the commonest scenario what we are commonly encountering but how frequently you are going to respond to your ppa as one of the most common precipitating factor for this cardiac event to us that we are not very sure how what is our level of knowledge in that area of cardiac but that's strongly to be addressed what is the reason see when you are going to use ppi the most common as you all know proton pump inhibitors is going to act in your in uh, hydrogen potassium atpase pathway so once it's going to take your act uh, action hydrogen potassium atpase pathway in your parietal cells of your stomach what's the main thing it's going to come to you it is going to prolong your intragastric ph for a longer long standing duration so once your parietal cell is going to get inhibited the hydrogen levels is going to come down so what is going to happen the acidity symptoms is going to get improved that's the main mechanism actually there are so many other molecules being interacting that it's not the main area to discuss but how far so when you are going to use ppi for various gi conditions what are the various adverse events you may face like major mac one thing why mac been reported because when you are using rabiprazole that's one good molecule definitely we need to consider because for a patient for example you are taking a scenario with the diabetes in the background of coronary artery disease when you are going to use rabiprazole it's very safe molecule to be considered because it is not going to interact with two major pathways cy cyp 2c19 and 3a4 pathways these pathways will act on your clopidogrel or warfarin one of the molecules you are going to use and that may predispose to worsening of your cardiac events there is a potential substance what is called as adme i think it's dimethyl arginine the compound so what is going to happen that dimethyl arginine levels is going to get accumulate once if your dimethyl arginine if it is going to get accumulate your nitric oxide synthase the cardiac nitric oxide synthase level is going to come down once the cardiac nitric oxide synthase is going to come down what is going to happen there is high possibility for you to have a vasodilatation the effect will be going down so there might be evidence of vasoconstriction or other problems that's the major reason for your coronary events to take on so the adma is one hypothetical event being reported in various papers even bmg and multiple other journals if you want to look into that there are so many areas to cover that so we need to be very cautious so in that area when you are using rabiprazole it will be very safely to be addressed 
and huge list of others even for example your starting from your hypomagnesemia starting from your bone fractures if you are going to use pba for long standing duration for example uh, your fundic gland hyperplasia for example now one important even we are not supposed to forget before you are going to wind up this session main thing is there is high possibility when you are going to use in icu setup so there is high possibility for the patient to go for worsening of septicemia there are many papers being documented that even for example in case of alcoholic hepatitis for example that's very common scenario even in alcoholism if the patient is going to have high liver enzymes at that point of junction also when you are going to use ppi the alcoholic hepatitis some patient there are some proven evidence that it might get worse second thing is apart from clostridium deficit there is some infection what's called antibiotic associated colitis if you are going to use ppi at that point of time what is going to happen your gastric ph is going to be in a neutralized way it's going to be more than 4 at that point what is going to be more of alkalinity will make you to predispose to various gastric organisms to flourish so at that point the clostridium deficit infection may supervene and so many viral events respiratory pneumonia there are so many papers are there to have a worsening of infection with this ppi so why i would like to point out this even your anemia may get worse and there are major other events there are papers if you are going to use ppi more than 6 to 16 percent of the population there is risk of worsening of cardiac events and 40 to 50 percent of the population may have evidence of worsening of your nephro events for example your chronic kidney disease may get previous post to that and apart from that for example some patient may report even with interstitial nephritis there are so many other adverse events as well but even then we are being using ppi day in and day out now nowadays we have been using ppis in dual release preparation and in monomeric preparation so many doses are there now next kind of problem is being the ragiprost has come into the market with 440 mg so when you are going to use for prolonged duration so how far this is going to have a sustainable effect and one more thing what i like to address here most of the patient who are presenting to us will be having a predominant ga symptoms like dyspeptic symptoms and most of the patient will be having functional events as you are well aware about around 50 to 70 around 80 percent of the population so organic causes will be only around 20 to 30 percent of the population so we need to look into functional causes of dyspepsia tackling a functional dyspepsia without any presentation we are going to do endoscopy you are not going to do you are not going to find anything that is a terminology called non ulcer dyspepsia so you are not going to find anything it doesn't mean the patient is not having any events not erosive reflex non erosive uh, uh, non erosive pathway is there so we need to be very cautious when you are going to use that the most important thing what i like to address is usage of ppi for a longer duration whether it is to be strongly condemned or not apart from that when you are going to use ppi with prokinetics what is the best of prokinetic you are going to consider because many of the molecules there have seen some prescriptions morning on prokinetic and evening on prokinetic so dual prokinetics in morning and night they are using followed by the patient may have worsening of other factors like your irritable bowel and other things may get precipitated because of your prokinetics so when you are using a patient we need to address the upper gastrointestinal separately and our lower gi separately and we need to tackle in effective way to manage this even successfully and usage of ppi should be done in a conscious way in case if you are planning to use ppi definitely we can go very well with ragiprazor but strongly considering the clinical events in which we are going to treat apart from that whenever we are going to manage we should always think about h2 blockers also even then the scenario is not being here for discussion because nocturnal acid breakthrough definitely a very good even if you are going to use rantidine as a dose of 300 mg at night time that shows a significant potential response for your nocturnal acid breakthrough to come in my personal experience rather than going for long standing continuous this is a ppi in lot of the cardiac you can also use with h2 blockers that's one potential area to be considered and there are new h2 blockers also being considered uh, been there in the market for them to consider but that's not the area now usage of ragiprazor definitely very good when compared to other molecules as sir rightly pointed out wrong I mean uh, rapid action rapid action prolonged action and apart from that risk of other cardiac and other events definitely is going to come down but erosive is a fragility for example there are four grades and once a patient is going for grade c and d definitely we need to use ppi rather than using h2 block 
Among PPI, the best one is rabiprazole, no doubt about that. Among prokinetics, in order to, if you are going to use always the best one, we need to consider is ichopride as the first best molecule. Next to that, we can consider with sinitopride as being considered as the second best molecule. And these are all the things that, whatever it comes from my mind, I would like to address here. But if you have any doubts here to interact, definitely it's have to take all the discussion with us. Sir. So these are all the literature, sir. but if you are going to have any patient with bone fracture, we are not going to think about uh, PPI. So we are not very sure whether this because of uh, this PPI is being worsening everywhere. And only thing when you are going to do a dual energy x-ray absorption entry, retrospectively when you are going to look into all these papers, then might be having evidence of clues to think about that. Because what they are telling, it is going to inhibit your pathway of calcium as well as vitamin D. The levels may go down at this point of time, you may have evidence of worsening your bone fracture. But these things are going to need to get addressed, and our experience is definitely low. And my study, my personal point of view, I have never seen much of cases with bone fracture. B12 deficiency, deficiency anemia, anemia yeah, definitely very well. Yes, frequently been encountered, sir. Because the one thing, as you all know, the R binder is a very important factor, the intrinsic factor, pathway is going to mainly interact with your. Uh, this one, your uh, I mean, uh, your PPI molecules. At that point, if the binder is not going to release sustainably, there might be evidence of your B12 deficiency again progress. As we all know, the B12 is going to predominantly get absorbed in your terminal ileum, so the binder factor has to be strongly addressed. If it is not going to get addressed, that's an area for you to handle with multiple complications. But these are all we will be seen retrospectively in our practice. We need to treat, that's why usage of PPI to be used cautiously, that's one of the most important things for me to get addressed here before we are going to find out the sessions. And what about the serum uh, trans, amino transferase? Possibility of course, that's what, that's what, when you are going to use in a patient with alcohol or hepatitis at that point of time, when you are going to use PPI, there is high possibility for you to have a worsening of this incident. And any patient in ICU setup, you need to be cautious. Even if the patient is not consuming alcohol, the patient might be having in caps or a transient acid. So many other presentation might be a coexisting presentation. And when you are going to use PPI, that might be a precipitating factor for you to worsen. So you need to see the age to whom you are going to treat, what is the basic uh, uh, anthropometric status and clinical presentation, all those things you need to take into consideration, various coexisting comorbid complications, everything to be addressed when you are going to use a PPI, that too in a long standing duration, that too when combined with the prokinetic. What about the role of semethicone? Role of semethicone, these are all mean short lasting, definitely we can consider, but when you are going to use semethicone and all for long standing duration, you may have worsening of your reflux because it's not going to prevent your, uh, it's not going to heal your mucosa, only it's going to produce a temporary suppression. So it's the healing of mucosa in erosis, but it's definitely not going to get up because it might be another thing. A temporary gastric suppression might be a protection critical. How much are supposed to control nausea and vomiting? But levo surprise, in case of chemotherapy induced nausea, that is much better. Levo sulfate definitely we can very well use that, but there are so many potential adverse events we need to get addressed uh, because neurotoxicity is more common with levo sulfate at a dose of around 75. When you are going to use levo sulfate, you need to be cautious whether the patient has neurotoxicity, toxicity, neurological symptoms, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, coexisting other things, all, everything to be addressed. Are we looking into all those things before using levo sulfate? And moreover, the strong prokinetic if the patient is having ideas and other presentation, the function GI disorder when I mean, you are going to use that itself will worsen your complication. So, that's what we have been discussing, to whom you are going to use, whether the low AGA symptoms is not that active, whether the patient is not having any IBS type C or diary present. IBS type C, okay, to some extent, but when you are going to use, for example, a type 2 diabetic, morbid obese, if the patient is having a diary presentation, at that point of time, if you are going to use, that might be precipitating your worsening of your So, any molecules in gastroenterology, you need to be very cautious. That to PPI, you need to be absolutely cautious when you are going to combine with anything. But where is the signal supplied and... Uh, Potentially safe. Sir, what do you mean by fast acting, faster acting or fast? How does going to impact on the symptomatic? Patient will have dyspepsia. Sir, so when you are going to use, there are various preparations of PPA. For example, your gelatin coat or your encapsulated forms. Now, for your H2 bicognate based derivative form, 
See, when you're going to use your bicorporate conference, what been served and this one served, we pointed out. So when you're going to use that, there will be a rapid onset of action because it's going to act as a rapid buffer. But at that point of time, the patient may have evidence of co-existing sodium loads. Sodium loads and toxicity may have very Those things we need to get addressed. But any molecule, even if you're going to, for example, if you're going to use proton pump inhibitor, and all those things that you're going to think, the main role, the potential duration, minimum for six to eight hours to be considered for a duration of action. So what's the main, main thing is that, your question is that, what, what do you mean fast time? Fast, fast. Main thing is that, on a, when you're going to use TPIs on a PRN basis, that is when you really want a fast time. When you're you going to use PPA on a continuous basis, the half-life of PPA is so, any of the PPAs by the end of the day would have knocked out most of the forms. And by the time the serum level is so that you take one dose or two dose of PPA from the fifth day, all the forms are gone, it will be super and you will not have much of a difference. But suppose you are off PPAs, and you just on that day you've got dyspeptic symptoms, and you want that to happen. There are a few things that I very, very quickly and swiftly. One, you want to neutralize your symptoms immediately and does it something. Just take it and you've got to have instant action. But then, you know, the problem with antacids are that taste, you've got to drink a lot of liquid, you can have rebound symptoms. So you want something to act very, very fast, just that you want a fast acting PPA. The best would be primary blood which is fast acting. That's the only thing. But when you take PPA for the long run, you know, the fast acting, short acting doesn't make any difference. Regarding the etiology, <coughs> Somebody pointed out the role of H. pylori. PPA also has a role in anti -H. No doubt about that, sir. For H. pylori indication, without PPA, there is no regimen for that. Because all the regimen used for triple drug therapy, sequential therapy, even for modern therapy, whatever therapy you are going to use, the PPA has to be strongly existed. All of the PPA you are going to use, but it has to be considered for a period of at least 14 days of duration. When you are using it as a quadruple or as a triple drug regimen. So, PPI will be strongly considered for H. pylori education. But, H. pylori, when even after treating that, because there are so many methodologies and serologists being available to diagnose, and nowadays, a few days before, say, I've seen a patient who has been simply done the urine test of zero, and repeatedly been treated with multiple uh, education H. pylori regimen for uh, many years. He almost took more than five to seven times in a span of time, and he presented to us with a similar person evidence. So those things should be addressed when you are going to use this for long term duration. H. pylori eradication, PPA as a definite rule. But H. pylori eradication doesn't mean you are going to prevent your reflex. H. pylori eradication is being having a role to prevent your peptic ulcer and worsening of people. But your gastric esophageal reflex, even if you are using your H. pylori eradication, doesn't mean it will get controlled. There is no potential uh, co coexisting events which is being happening with them. You may have worsening of reflex might get happened even if you control your H. pylori. Regarding the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory